Hey everyone, good evening. Uh, we're excited for tonight's panel. We're just gonna give people some time to trickle in. Uh, I'll get the heads up at some point when we've reached critical mass, but if folks would like to, I don't know, is the chat disabled, Rachel? Probably so, since she's gonna send me comments. Norm, <laughs> well, I would have asked people to tell me where they were from. As Chase knows, in true ACLU tradition, a little tactic I learned from our friend Tanika Boyd, but you all will just have to uh, sit in, <laughs> in cyber world for a while while the rest of the audience trickles in. But thank you again for attending. Recording in progress. Well, why don't I just start casual conversation because I hate hate silence uh, and ask our panelists where they're calling in from. Chase. I am here in New York City in the borough of Queens. Uh, um, it's loud outside. There's <laughs> a child that could interrupt, but uh, that's what's happening over here. Thank you. Thank you. Caitlin. I'm checking in from uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, no children, uh, unfortunately, here. However, you might hear my cat occasionally. Uh, he likes to try to jump on my lap during these things. Okay. Children, felines are doing well. Rodrigo, what you got? <laughs> hey, I'm also in Washington, D.C., but I don't have cats. I don't have kids. I, I'm just in an empty space. I'm really missing out. I got I to gotta upgrade my situation here. <laughs> I'm just in a silent room. I literally work in a closet, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of puns there to be had in the LGBT movement, but, you know, working from home, do what you got to do. <laughs> I hear that. Well, good. Well, thank you all again. Good evening to our attendees who are on the East Coast and good, evening, good afternoon to our attendees who are on the West Coast and somewhere in between good evening, good afternoon if you're in the middle of the country, depending on your time zone. My name is Rakeem Brooks. I am the new president of the Alliance for Justice. Uh, after 42 years, our founder, Nan Aaron, has stepped down and passed off the reins to me. And I'm very honored for this to be my very first public event with all of you and for it to be a holding court event. Um, as you know, holding court is our opportunity to convene today's leading advocates, attorneys, and elected officials to discuss issues related to our courts, our rights, and the justice system. And tonight's topic couldn't be more timely. While states are facing health crises and economic challenges, and citizens are dying at an alarming rate from the deadly COVID-19 virus, and families are strained to balance work, school, and childcare, as well as just ordinary life. Um, yet, instead of addressing these issues, many states are uh, seem to be hell bent on a new assault on transgender children, in particular. And that's going to be the topic of discussion tonight. Just to update folks who are unaware of what's happening throughout the country, legislators in states like Texas and Arkansas have made it a priority to take away people's rights this year alone. Over 110 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in 33 states, making it the worst year for anti-LGBT legislation since 2015. These bills are directly attack attacking uh, children and other LGBTQ members um, from their access to healthcare, to their safety and ability to participate in sports and other activities um, in public spaces. And it's not just legislators, we've seen hostile, hostile, I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable school board meetings where our fellow citizens all too often have displayed contempt um, for people's right to exist as they define themselves, um, their gender identity and for expressing their identity in general. And so uh, sort of with a heavy heart that we have to bring this panel together, but um, as, these things go uh, in the spirit of moving forward. We tried to convene some of the smartest people we know uh, who can give us some insight into this topic and how we might move forward together and assist the LGBT community, particularly the trans community. And so I'm gonna introduce our panelists, uh, Chase Strangio, did I get that right, Chase? I was trying to like nail it, yes. Okay, Chase Strangio, though Chase and I work together, it's just, <laughs> it was hard. Who was the, is the Deputy Director for Transgender Justice with the ACLU's LGBTQ and HIV uh, project and a nationally recognized expert on transgender rights. Chase's work includes impact litigation as well as legislative and administrative advocacy on behalf of LGBTQ people and people living with HIV across the United States. We now also have Caitlin Burns, hopefully 
Uh, she's in the same section of the screen for you as she is for me on the upper left-hand corner. Caitlin is a freelance journalist, contributing writer at Vox and columnist at MSNBC Daily. She is the first openly trans Capitol Hill reporter in United States history. And her other work has been featured for the Washington Post, Vice, Elle Magazine, Esquire, and Playboy. Hey now, among other things. <laughs> she is also co-host of Cancel Me Daddy podcast. I love that. <laughs> Finally, but last but not least, we have Rodrigo Hang, Hang Layton. I hope I pronounced that right, Rodrigo. Uh, who is a transgender policy advocacy and messaging expert. As a Cuban-American transgender man, he has wide-ranging experience in the LGBTQ movement and has covered field organizing, leadership development, fundraising, and media advocacy. He previously worked for Freedom for All Americans, GLAAD, the Transgender Law Center, Gender Justice LA, and the National LGBTQ Task Force. He joined NCTE as Deputy Executive Director in 2019, and like me, stepped up to become an Executive Director in the year 2021. So we were just talking about the club or trauma group we need to form as new Executive Directors. But in any case, welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, what we'll do is talk just to the audience, we'll talk with the panelists for about 45 minutes or so before opening it up to you. And so you should feel free to submit your questions by e emailing rachel at afj.org. That's R-A-C-H-E-L, Rachel, the way it's normally spelled, <laughs> at afj.org. All right, so jumping right in, Chase, uh, if you don't mind us starting with you, I wonder if you could give us an overview of some of these bills. Um, who are they targeting and what exactly are they trying to restrict? Thank you so much um, for that introduction and for holding uh, this, this conversation. Um, as you mentioned, we are we are really in a moment of, of crisis, particularly when it comes to state legislative attacks on, on trans people, particularly trans youth, which is of course compounding an already dire situation for many trans people who in the pandemic and in general are facing you know, high rates of uh, unemployment, homelessness and, and violence, particularly facing black trans women um, continues to be uh, escalating as we also are now seeing these systemic attacks at the state uh, level in particular. In 2021, we had the most anti-trans bills that we've ever seen. Um, a majority of those bills targeted trans young people, particularly um, in two ways. First, as I think as you alluded to, um, efforts to ban trans women and girls from athletics. Um, and this, you know, is something that we that was was started very much in 2020. Um, and we were able to fight back against most of those bills in 2020, only Idaho passed their anti-trans sports bill that year. Um, but unfortunately, we had an additional seven states ban trans women and girls from sports um, in 2021. And Texas is now convening their third uh, spe special session, fourth uh, legislative session this year, and including uh, on the agenda another proposed attack on on trans youth in in, in sports. Um, and and then the other you know primary mode of attack on trans young people has been the effort to ban healthcare for trans minors. Um, we're talking about medically accepted protocols for care um, that are supported and approved by the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the American Psychological Association, every single major medical group in the United States um, supports this care. Um, it's already provided through very rigorous standards and is all too often out of reach for people. And yet we have states coming in in the middle of the pandemic, not only seeking to ban the care um, prospectively, but proposing ripping you know, kids off the care they're currently receiving. And in some cases, um, uh, criminalizing the care itself. In Alabama, for example, the proposed bill, which thankfully did not pass, was a, uh, would have made uh, the providing of the care or the referring of, uh, for the care a felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison. And Texas has introduced uh, multiple uh, pieces of legislation that would um, that would characterize the provision of care um, by parents or providers as a form of child abuse, which would obviously potentially um, result in having CPS or other forms of child protective services coming in and removing kids from supportive homes, which has been, um, though thankfully you haven't seen a bill like that pass, has been a source of such extreme panic um, for people. And unfortunately, Arkansas did pass a law banning health care for, for transgender minors, um, both the provision of the care and the referral for the care. We were thankfully able to get that law preliminarily enjoined before it went into effect. 
um, and we can talk about the what's going on in the courts. But legislatively, we've seen just such a sweeping array of legislation. Um, but those are, I think, the two primary uh, areas where the attacks have focused in 2021. Although there are there are many others as well. Really appreciate you providing that overview, which is sort of breathtaking in its scope. Um, I wondered if I could turn to you, Caitlin, and just ask. You know who's behind these bills? Uh, we, for some folks think that these things sort of happen by accident, but obviously they were happening all over the country at roughly the same time, being influenced by one another in a kind of coordinated fashion. And so, uh, could you just give us some insight into what's motivating this, and uh, who are the the funders and the backers? Uh, I could spend the rest of our time on this, so I will try to keep this brief. Um, I would say the major drivers uh, of this legislation on the national level are the Heritage Foundation, um, the uh, Alliance uh, Defending Freedom, um, both of whom are ultra right wing, you know, uh, lobby groups. Um, I think those are the two primary groups that are behind it, although they've managed to gather much of the right wing behind this, including the right wing blogosphere, the media sphere, um, Fox News runs, you know, regular anti-trans segments to try to radicalize viewers on these topics. Um, and I would actually also point outside of the United States to some influences, particularly to the United Kingdom, um, where they have a much different media environment over there that is almost institutionally transphobic. Uh, so um, one of the interesting things that you see actually on the state level are examples from the United Kingdom that get imported to the United States, you know, things that have never happened in the United States. Um, there's like one or two things that, that are kind of weird that have happened in the United Kingdom and they get imported to these state legislators where they're going, you know, this is the risk of, of what might happen if trans people are treated like everybody else, right? Um, if they have the same freedoms as everybody else, so we must restrict it. Um, and, you know, it's really frustrating for me as an American journalist because I want to tell this story, but American news outlets are only interested in the American side of the story. And I'm like, no, this is much bigger. Like, this goes to London, this goes to the Vatican. Like, there's all these players that have had a hand in shaping this discourse um, that it's a massive project. It's probably a book level project. Oh. And, um, you know, it, it's, it takes more than just me to cover it. And that's really frustrating. <laughs> sure. um, so, you know, in terms of who's behind it, this is very clearly um, one of the key planks of the Republican GOP conservative uh, electoral strategies, I think, going forward. So, you know, they want to produce ads that scaremonger about, you know, uh, men in women's sports or quote unquote men in, in women's spaces. Um, they think it pulls well for them and they're going to keep going with it. Uh, you know, thankfully, they haven't found a ton of success, even at the state legislature level, um, which you know I'm sure we'll go into more detail <laughs> with later. But this is an all-out push, and they're not going to stop until they win or their vote or their base loses interest. Yeah. And one just quick thing Please. to add, if um, I think, yeah, K Caitlin's point is so important that you know this is something we're seeing on a global scale. And if you look at the way in which trans people are positioned um, and, and under threat globally, the, it's very much part of what you know it often termed uh, gender ideology by far right governments. But often what we're seeing is with the rise of fascism around the world in places like Eastern Europe and Brazil, um, in the United States, in, the, in, 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 in Europe, um, you have these attacks on 
norms of gender and sexuality that are designed to consolidate power in the state in a particular way. And that's where we're seeing a lot of these attacks on, on trans people as well. And we should be greatly concerned in the United States about what it says for the future of our democracy when we allow these types of attacks um, to, to sort of dominate in government and, and where we're headed because often trans people are a canary in the coal mine. And I think we saw that um, in, the, in 2016 before the election of Donald Trump. Um, and I think there's a lot of global lessons to be learned. For sure. Well, let's bring yeah, it just, here we go. Sorry, go ahead. Just, just to add one more thing to that is um, I often get asked, you know, why should people who are not trans care about this? And it's like every time trans rights have been taken away somewhere, immediately something else also gets taken away. So if you look at a place like Hungary, um, they have effectively banned trans people from legally existing. Like trans people can still you know, dress mostly in private because it's a very bigoted society, but they have no legal recognition and like name, like legal name changes were reversed in that country. But Hungary also turned around and banned abortion. Like there are certain steps to this playbook and every right wing and every country is hoping to run it. So that that's why I say like, it's not just about trans people, it's about having a right to privacy from your government. Yeah. Rodrigo, I wanted to bring you into the conversation on a similar point about right-wing tactics. Uh, Caitlin has sort of laid out for us as this is part of a similar playbook. Are there new things that we're seeing in terms of how the right <laughs> wing is trying to frame this issue? Well, that's absolutely right, that this is part of a coordinated strategy. Uh, I know for a lot of people, it felt this year, earlier this year, like, wow, there's all of a sudden all of these anti-trans bills across all these different states, where did this come from? And certainly the people advocating for those bills uh, posture as though they were answering some grassroots need, but the truth couldn't be farther from it. Um, in fact, as, as Caitlin and Chase have flagged, this is really powered by well-funded, large organized right-wing organizations that are ideologically anti-trans and really they're ideologically anti-LGBT. These are the same people who fought against marriage equality and the same people who were behind the anti-trans bathroom bills, if folks remember the infamous HB2 in North Carolina. Um, so this, and what I think is really notable for us as activists is that these are the same players all the time but they workshop their ideas. They, they float sample legislation to these different state legislators um, to try to get them to do their dirty work. But what's really important, the reason I really bring that up that it's the same people behind all of this is that to me, it represents desperation in some ways on their end. You know, it used to be that these kinds of positions wouldn't even be controversial, but Interestingly, and really, I think, optimistically, support for LGBTQ people and specifically trans people like me has been growing over time. So I think our opposition has gotten desperate. You know, they, they went after us because, you know, let's be real, uh, to them, all LGBTQ people are just kind of all the same. They don't draw distinctions between us. So they went after us on marriage equality and they fought us and they fought us and eventually we won. <laughs> So then they were like, okay, what do we do next? And they thought transgender people. So they went after us on the bathroom bills and we fought them and we fought them. And eventually we did win. So then they got desperate and even more desperate. And now they're trying to cling onto whatever foothold they can to step, to turn back the tide of what is otherwise actually growing support for transgender people. So they focus group this and they came to, the strategy of attacking trans youth. They are now trying to exploit the public's lack of information about what it means to be a transgender young person. Um, and they're trying to spread all this misinformation. But I think it's really important that they are doing this because public opinion is actually growing and because they're actually on the losing side over the long run and they know it, so they're getting desperate. Now, the stakes are still very high and we have to fight tooth and nail against these attacks legislatively because 
they hurt actual trans people, both young and old, when these bills are even floated in a legislature, let alone has a vote or even passes. But it's important to put this in a context of growing public support. This is what happens in social change. This is what happens in every social movement, including the trans movement, but for any social movement. You take two steps forward, one step back, you make progress, and then the opposition fights you harder than ever before because they feel threatened. That's what's happening here. It means that we still have a long fight ahead of us, but I do think it means that we're winning. I love that. That's so, so helpful um, in terms of context, given how absurd so much of this is. If I could transition just a little bit from state legislatures to courts, because we are the Alliance for Justice and obviously have been fighting for a fair judiciary for over 40 years. Um, Chase, could you help contextualize the role that the courts are playing presently uh, in the anti-trans movement? Obviously, President Donald Trump appointed an unprecedented number of judges who were openly anti-LGBTQ and anti-trans um, in their judicial decisions prior or even their legal advocacy prior to ascending to the bench. Uh, and um, these are the people who are going to be considering whether or not the legislation that you're that we've been talking about is constitutional or not. And you are one of the people who will likely be <laughs> appearing before this judiciary. So we just wanted you to give the audience some context for um, the legal battles ahead. Yes, I would say as I, 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 I serve in multiple capacities and I would say as a, as a litigator, I do not share Rodrigo's optimism <laughs> about the future. Um, and I would like to be more optimistic about where we're headed, but I think the stakes are, you know, are really high and there are days like, I, I'm not a by nature optimistic person, but nor am I a real like nihilistic person, I think it is, but there have been moments like, especially like in the recent activity with the Supreme Court, for example, over SB, the abortion um, law out of Texas, like, where I've just been like, what's the point of what we're doing? And I think it's easy to feel that way sometimes. It doesn't mean we give up, but I think you know all of the tools in our toolbox are important. And I think we have a real crisis on our hand with the judiciary. Um, that said, we've had unbelievable success in the lower courts blocking anti-trans laws. And so um, we have at the ACLU, um, I'm currently litigating um, cases in um, Idaho, uh, which is a challenge to their ban on, on trans women and girls in sports. Um, that case, we, we got a preliminary injunction last summer um, before the District of Idaho in, in frankly, one of the best trans opinions that I've ever read. Um, it was on equal protection grounds. The judge really got it. He, he, he completely discredited and, and found that there was no legitimate basis for the government's um, uh, justifications for, for the ban. Um, he really dug into our expert testimony, um, really also sort of recognizing the harm to the trans women and girls who are being excluded and singled out. Um, and, and saying it was you know, completely outrageous to compare trans women and girls to, to cis men and boys, um, which is a really important decision. Uh, it's on appeal at the Ninth Circuit. It's back on a sort of remand on a question of mootness. Um, you know, the, but, but right now the injunction is in place. The law is not in effect. So you know, from, from our perspective, you know, slowing it down is fine. Um, we continue to litigate that. Um, we also have a challenge to West Virginia's law um, banning trans women and girls from sports. Um, we also got a preliminary injunction in that case. Um, and, and actually the state did not appeal. Um, so that case is moving forward at the district court um, on equal protection and, and Title IX grounds. And then in Arkansas, we sued pretty soon after the state passed their sweeping ban on healthcare for trans minors. And we were able to get a preliminary injunction. Um, actually, I appeared in person in court for the first time since the pandemic in Little Rock. Um, it was really interesting to just it was really beautiful actually to be there in court with our clients, which is something we've really lost from the pandemic. Um, and, you know, both in the organizing side and in the litigation side, you know, really being able to show up and, and, and be there in solidarity, especially as a trans lawyer with trans clients, I always find it so meaningful to be there. Um, and, and we were able, the judge actually ruled from the bench, which is very unusual as folks probably know, um, and blocked the law um, days before it was set to go into effect, finding that we were likely to succeed on the merits of our 
equal protection claims um, and our due process claims because we have claims on behalf of the parents. You know, there is a robust tradition in this country in theory of uh, the fundamental rights of parents to direct the care um, and uh, uh, well-being of their children. And this, obviously, we're talking about healthcare that already requires parental consent. Um, the way they talk about it, you would think that kids are like eight years old, like walking into CVS by themselves and getting hormones. We're, we're talking about care that is incredibly difficult to get, usually requires both parents' consent. Um, there's very few providers who are, you know, who are providing it. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, the real problem is lack of access, not over accessibility. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we had the judge also found we we're likely to succeed on our due process claims, as well as our First Amendment claims, um, because the law also bans referrals. Um, we are now on appeal at the Eighth Circuit not the greatest place to be um, and then the supreme court um likely at, at some point and so there's there's real reason to be concerned if you think about what's going on in states like texas and states like arkansas we then are contending with appeals courts like the fifth circuit like, like the eighth circuit that are stacked with conservative judges but also trumpian conservative judges and so there's there's lots of reasons to be concerned as well as when we get up to to the u.s supreme court um, so obviously what we have to do is not just build out our legal argument, but change the paradigm of thinking across the country so that when judges are considering these cases, that they have a basis of understanding beyond just the papers that they're reading um, before them. And that is going to be critical um, to our success, but also to our survival, um, because taking away health care is life or death, um, as we know. And, and these, these cases are, are truly life or death. Um, just one quick note um, on the litigation side, as, as, as Caitlin mentioned, in the UK, so much is being imported from the UK, including um, a judicial decision in a case called Bell versus Tavistock um, that resulted in the, the taking away of care from minors across England and Wales. Um, that decision had been referenced in state legislatures repeatedly and brought up in, in litigation, um, even though it actually wasn't on point for what was going on in the US and the legal system and health systems in the UK are very different. Um, it, it had been manipulated and really taken hold here in the US, but last week it was thankfully overturned on appeal. Um, so hopefully that will neutralize, not that you know we're dealing in facts and science, but ne neutralize some of the arguments against us, both in the legislatures and in court. Um, but I think it's an uphill battle, um, even though we've had a lot of success at the district court level. Yeah, I'm actually uh, pleasantly surprised at how much success you've had at the district court level, and hopefully that continues at the circuit court level um, and up to the Supreme Court. But like you, I am <laughs> not not all that optimistic, um, though there are gestures in some ways towards um, having equality affirming uh, results and decisions. Um, I wondered if I might transition from Chase and legal strategies as ways of opposing uh, Caitlin and come back to you. Um, about how we might think about confronting uh, wherever we are in these states, this legislation. Um, and Rodrigo, you should feel free to come in on this as well. But what is it that folks who don't have law degrees could be doing, or even who have law degrees but don't have the time to litigate, could be doing um, to challenge uh, these really um, terrible bills throughout the country? Yeah, maybe, so maybe what have you seen from other countries as well? So <laughs> uh, I actually think the United States does pretty well in fighting back against a lot of this stuff. So um, I don't know that I have an international example of of fighting back other than perhaps, um, you know, in Russia, which is so much more backwards than the United States, there actually is a really strong alliance between um, feminists, radical feminists, uh, trans activists, and LGBT, you know, gay rights activists, where they all stick together because they all understand that their fates lie together, right? And um, what you see in uh, particularly the United Kingdom, but also here in the U.S., is you see efforts to divide that alliance, right? And and that's how they sap our power away. So one thing I will say is just keep the solidarity. Um, the other thing, too, is there's so much just general misinformation and, and, and stuff floating out there that's just designed to get people outraged. And, you know, what I would say is, like, if you hear something that seems outrageous, like take a step back for a second, 
take a deep breath and really think about it because chances are if you put five minutes of thought into it and you don't fly off the handle you're going to realize this isn't actually adding up or this isn't actually what it seems trans people are completely normal i mean i live in an apartment with my cat like that like millions of people do that right like i'm not some monster that Fox News wants you to think. So where, where I'm headed with this is, I think the best way that just everyday people can fight back on this is not being afraid to have conversations, right? If you have a trans friend, talk to your you know cis friends or your non-trans friends about your trans friend. And, and, and like, if you hear stuff being discussed in your friend group or you're out for drinks or uh, well, I don't know, COVID, like nobody goes out for drinks anymore, I guess. But if you're having these discussions, like don't be afraid to just, you know, kind of defend us. Cause I think at this point it's a battle of hearts and minds and whoever wins is going to end up winning in the long run, despite what happens, you know, over the next 10 to 15 years in the court or in the legislatures, like um, the LGBT movement's biggest strength has almost always been changing the culture. Um, and that's what I think needs to happen here. Um, there's so many great resources out there. I haven't been as productive this year as a journalist as I have in years past, but I have a deep catalog myself where I, you know, basically any of these fake controversies that you come up and they're always recycled. I've probably written about them, right? So if you hear about, you know, somebody winging about uh, the use of the term pregnant person, you can probably just Google Caitlin Burns pregnant person and there's an article for it, right? So I hate to tout myself for all of this stuff, but like these things are being discussed and have been discussed ad nauseum. Um, I really for the last 50 years, but especially over the last like five, six uh, years. So what I'm saying is there are resources out there don't be afraid to stand by your convictions and realize that this is a fight for solidarity and whoever wins the hearts and minds is probably going to win. I'm not yeah. sure if that's the answer you were looking for, but <laughs> that's where I went with it. That, that was well stated. And so it doesn't matter what I was asking for. <laughs> I'll, I'll take what I was given. I'm sorry, Rodrigo, please go ahead. No, that's great. And yeah, I absolutely agree with Caitlin. Like this is to some degree, a battle of hearts and minds. It is also a battle in the courts, but I'm not an attorney. Some of y'all in the audience might not be an attorney. And I think when you're not an attorney, um, if you approach this issue as just being about the courts, then it can feel disempowering. It can feel like you don't have a role to play. So I really like what Caitlin was saying about the culture layer to this, because that gives all of us agency. That gives all of us something we can do. From an activism perspective, um, I'd offer two really concrete things. The first is to contact your state and local legislators if you hear about something in your state or municipality. Um, if you hear about something at the state level, it's pro anti-trans, I mean, it's probably going to be a sports ban or a healthcare ban. If you hear about something at the local level, it's probably going to be something about your school district. Um, all of it is equally important. What I hear a lot is people thinking, is, is people finding out, see, reading a headline that there's an anti-trans bill being floated in their state, but reacting, oh, that's never going to pass. And uh, sure, maybe, maybe it's going to fail, but if it fails, but for it to, we are seeing our opposition purposefully reintroduce bills year after year after year after year to increase their margin every time. So it is on us to not just passively let a bill be defeated, but to actively defeat it so loudly that the opposition does not try it again, because they will try it again if we do not put up a wall that stops them. So if you live in maybe a blue state, or if you live in a place uh, where you think an anti-trans bill isn't going to pass, do not take that for granted. Still pick up the phone and call your state or local legislator uh, so that they really hear you loud and clear. 
you can sign up for email alerts at NCTE. Our website is transequality.org. We'll alert you if you put in your zip code. That way we know what state you're in. I'm sure ACLU will do that too. I'm sure Caitlin tweets when these bills are introduced, like ask, sign up for these things and sign up for these alerts so that you're notified when something happens in your state or your municipality and you can contact your lawmaker right away. The second thing is um, to sign up at passtheequalityact.org. For folks who don't know, the Equality Act is a federal bill that would extend non-discrimination protections to all LGBTQ people, obviously including those of us who are trans. This is a really, this would be a really bedrock piece of legislation that would strengthen our case on so many different levels. It's in the Senate right now, uh, we need some more Republican support to be able to overcome a filibuster, but we also need Democrats to hear from us too, to hear that this is a priority. So no matter what state you live in, pick up the phone, call your senator, urge them to pass the Equality Act, um, and you can sign up for alerts about that or look up information about it at passtheequalityact.org. Just like good panelists, you all have run through my questions, <laughs> always answering more. But I did have some follow-ups from things that you said that really piqued my interest. Chase, you have the uh, great opportunity, luxury isn't the right word, maybe the blessing of being able to meet trans people throughout the country. And so therefore to see different environments in which folks are living and um, the threats under which they live. And I wonder, if you have any reflections about that, Rodrigo's um, emphasizing the need wherever you are to confront these bills, because though they may not pass, they can have, um, for lack of a better term, a chilling effect on someone's life, their ability to live out loud in the way that they would see fit. I'm wondering what you've seen out in the country. Sometimes in the, you know, most of us are in New York or DC on this call, I think all of us, you know, we, we get very comfortable assuming that the rest of the country and the rest of the world is like the existence, um, shares the existence that we have, but obviously that's not the case. But we, you know, we then don't have the benefit that you do of um, having traveled to places and experienced and heard these stories. So I wondered if you would share just a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that's such an important question. And there is there are such disparities in terms of what people's experiences are geographically, um, whether they're in urban or rural environments, obviously, like what, what their access is to housing and employment, which is informed by, you know, so many things in terms of the way in which systemic, you know, violence and discrimination operates, um, as well as what the what the legal uh what the laws are in, in various places. I mean, one thing I've been struck by in my real privilege to be able to travel to lots of places before the pandemic in particular, and a little bit since the pandemic, um, is just, you know, ultimately it's the people in these communities where they're facing the attacks that are doing the work long-term, organizing, holding each other in all the ways, like making sure people are fed, cared for, transportation is provided. You know, the capitals may be really far from where people live. You think of a place like South Dakota, which is often like the epicenter of anti-trans bills, Pierre is, 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 is hours away from Sioux Falls or, and, and, and other places that are the population centers of, of those states. And people are organizing to make sure people have the tools um, to engage with their, with their legislators and to go and testify, which can be incredibly difficult emotionally, physically, logistically. Um, and so I'm just struck, and, and, and folks in Texas, I mean, people are organizing in Texas against so much. You, you know, they, they only convene their legislature every other year, um, but they have just been brutalized and under attack on every front. Um, you know, it's the continued, uh, you know, voter suppression bills and the anti-abortion bills and the anti-trans bills. Um, you know, all of the issues about what, how to safely, you know, send our kids to school. Um, so I, you know, for me, the, the insight is send, send money, send resources, send support to the local grassroots organizations, to the trans-led organizations that are holding it down, especially if we start, I mean, it is very likely that we will see a time when healthcare is unavailable <laughs> to trans people and even more so than it is now. And it's gonna be just like with the abortion funds, it's gonna be people on the ground who are gonna make sure that people get that care. Trans people have always been able to survive and care for each other. We get each other the healthcare that we need. That is something we know how to do. Um, but we can only do that if we continue to support the informal and formal grassroots networks that exist in these places. Um, so I often refer people to the Trans Justice Funding Project that has a list of grassroots organizations that are trans led across the country as a good place to look for, for if you want to give um, to trans led organizations, um, particularly in this time of crisis. 
Thank you for that. Um, Caitlin, I, similarly, something that struck me about our earlier conversation was the lack of journalism about mm -hmm. these issues and the extent to which you're sort of standing in the gap, um, taking up a lot of space rightfully because these are important issues, but maybe maybe more than you would like to, uh, that you <laughs> seeking allies and people to be supportive and also do some of this work. So could you talk about you know, the relationship between journalism and covering this movement and the attacks on trans, trans folks and what we might do to even encourage our local newspapers and media outlets mm -hmm. to be more aware of what's happening? I'm going to start off really grim because I think I'm the nihilist of this group. Um, oh, Chase is Chase pretty nihilistic. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can fake it, but I think I have him beat. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that there are more transphobes employed at major U.S. media outlets than there are trans people. Um, there's like no formal statistic for that, but I'd be willing to put, you know, my entire professional reputation on that fact. Um, so already trans people are starting from a disadvantage. And if you think about how institutional power works um, and you think about the important positions that exist, you know, throughout the United States, there are no trans people in the US Congress. There's like five or six state legislators who are trans in the entire country. Um, there are no trans college provosts. Um, there is, there has only been one openly trans, you know, elected, um, like, cabinet member. I don't even know if she's in the cabinet, but she's, you know, works, she's the, um, she runs OSH, which is the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, Rachel Levine. There are very few, like, there are no editors-in-chief of major publications who are trans. I think one at Reuters is a major like executive editor. Um, that's it, that's all we got. Like they're like, it's very difficult for trans people to get a foothold in any institution of power and the media is no exception. Um, and I found that, you know, personally frustrating. It's why I've sort of leaned into being a freelancer where <laughs> I'm just my own boss. <laughs> um, and it, it provides a lot of flexibility for me. Um, but there are no trans people who are covering trans issues on an everyday basis that any, you know, English speaking media outlet basically in the world. So, we're, you know, <laughs> You saw it with the gay rights movement where um, LGBT desks would be started at these publications and they would hire gay people to staff them, right? And you saw this at BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, you know, you go down the line of sort of left-leaning media and you don't see that uh, now with the trans movement. You still have the same gay people now reporting on trans people um, and it can make the storytelling side of things very difficult. Um, you know, you you talk you talk to Chase about meeting you know trans people from all over the country. I've done a little bit of that myself. You know, I interviewed a mom from Arkansas who has an extremely stable job in that state, and she's like, "Yeah, if this bill, like, we're gonna fight this bill, but if it stands, we are moving to a different state." And we had a whole discussion about, well, where would you move? And she's looking at the map and it's like every state around her also has these same bills proposed. So it's like, where's she going to go? Like Illinois and then commute to her job in Arkansas? That doesn't make sense either. So we're talking about, this is a person who has spent their entire life in Arkansas now having to uproot because their state legislature simply doesn't want them to live there. Um, and I think that a lot of people look at the issue of trans youth health care and they sort of blanch at it or they get scared about it. And I sort of want to demystify what it is, right? It's puberty blockers when hormone starts and it's, you know, cross-sex hormones later on. Um, and I just want to relate it to my own experience. I did not have any of that stuff. I ended up having to like get like $100,000 worth of surgery just to reverse what I could from my own puberty. And there are still things that I will never be able to reverse. I mean, my voice is very deep. It's mostly not passing for a, you know, quote unquote, woman's voice. My shoulders are very broad. Puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones can like 
alleviate that. That's all these parents want for their kids is to have their kids be able to make a choice of their own about this stuff. I think it's been over politicized uh, to the point of ridiculousness. Um, and I know I wandered <laughs> all over with my answer there, but again, it all comes back to, don't be afraid to have these conversations with people. Caitlin, I will take a road trip with you anywhere. You can wander <laughs> all you want. Uh, I, I, I was very, um, I was sincerely enriched by what you shared with us. And so thank you for, for doing so. Um, to your point about having open conversations, that was an open moment of dialogue and very meaningful to me and I'm sure for um, the members of the audience. Uh, I'm gonna transition to audience questions though. I have more that I'd like to ask, but we'll see if we run out and then I can have the a moderator's privilege towards the end. But Rodrigo, I was curious, one person asked, and this seemed like a question that could be directed to you first, for people and organizations that are turning to work on trans policy projects, what do you advise for getting going without recreating the wheel? Oh, that's a great question. Well, first, thank you for getting going on it. I mean, that's the first step, right? And one, one resource I would offer is the Trans Journalists Association. They have a style guide on their website that covers a lot of these topics that you might encounter. Uh, they also have um, a lot of resources there. So if you are in a position, like let's say you want um, a write-up for your website and you're, you're willing to pay a guest blogger, you know, find someone in the Trans Journalists Association, to Caitlin's point, like find an actual trans person to write for you on trans issues or to advise you on trans issues. The Trans Journalists Association can connect you with people in your area or with that subject matter expertise you're looking for. Um, also, their style guide, again, will walk you through a lot of topics, and I really underscore that because trans topics are new to a lot of us. Um, and, you know, even when someone is coming out as trans, you know, you're not born with a microchip in your brain that tells you all the information, right? Like, you still got to learn about trans rights in the landscape as a trans person yourself, especially if you weren't already an activist. So their style guide um, kind of walks you through the most uh, common language and the most pitfalls and how to avoid them. So that's a really good go-to resource. Um, there's also uh, asso associations out there of trans consultants who you can hire to advise you if you're, let's say, setting up a program, if you run a nonprofit and you're, you're adding trans rights to your portfolio of issue areas, well, you could hire a trans policy freelancer to walk you through the topics. Um, this is a really fan, all of uh, hiring trans people for these gigs is a really effective way for you to get the work really grounded and getting going right and supporting economic opportunity for trans people who have the lived experience that is going to enhance that expertise. Thank you for that. Uh, Chase, this one might be best directed to you <laughs> only because it's so grand. Who is the best contact for engaging <laughs> on the work against anti-trans healthcare bills? I'm sure we'll take uh, your top three organizations, but I just love that the person was like, no, no, no. I wanna know exactly who I'm supposed to go to. Don't misdirect me, um, Let's be around the block. I need to know their name, their address, their apartment. <laughs> yeah, so the good question. I when you find out, let me know. Um, but no, I think that it depends in what way. So I think if you want like the sort of people who are coordinating at the national level to support the states and identify the states, then I would go to the Equality Federation um, and particularly the topping um, for sort of the this we, we're tracking and we're supporting and we have contacts in each state you know I, I for the ACLU I do that part of the work but I would say I'm you know if you're talking about the best it's Viv I can be like a deputy on that um and 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 it's really just looking at all the bills I don't know that they're sort of singling out each type and we're, we're, we're organizing against all of them obviously then in particular states there's coalitions and 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 
I, you know, many of us can um, connect you to specific groups, uh, individuals in, in the different states. And we all have like a different, we all have different ways of, of connecting, um, you know, freedom, for, you know, I personally am always in conversation with um, Freedom for All Americans and, and Equality Federation um, and then Athlete Ally on the sports bills. And then, you know, then that's at the national sort of C4 lobbying side and then um, working out with all of the groups in the states. Um, but we're all working on this stuff and there, we need everyone. Um, so I'll think about the best, best contact, but I would say dip topping at Equality Federation. I don't know what others think. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for humoring me. Um, Caitlin, back, back to you. Uh, this question was for healthcare advocates, what can we do to educate our colleagues and bring them in on uh, bring them in on the team. I was wondering if there were any journalistic resources that you would point to that you think do the best job of um, helping folks to understand the trans movement, trans people, the issues that they face, um, and they need not just be journalistic, but you know, where, yeah. where would you get someone started? Uh, I would say WPATH. Um, which uh, I always forget what it stands for, actually, because we just call it WPATH, but it's like the World Professional Association. Yeah, that's what it is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I brain you know worms. brain worms on a on a Tuesday evening. Um, I just call it WPATH, so I apologize for that. Uh, is a really good place to start to sort of learn what the actual standards and recommendations are, right? That kind of cuts through a lot of the, the media noise um, from the other side. Um, you asked about journalistic resources. I mean, I've written extensively about this. Um, several other trans you know, writers have written about this extensively. Um, in too many to name. And if I start naming them, I'm going to leave somebody out and then we can get no, an angry okay. DM. Uh, so I don't want to necessarily go there. <laughs> um, but uh, one source in particular uh, to, to, to focus on the, the trans youth health bans on the state level that I would direct people to, um, and I'll see if I can um, find it uh, before our session ends, but I wrote a piece about um, the sort of the case that kicked all of this off with the trans health stuff. Um, the The young person's name was Luna Younger, and a couple of years ago she was nine years old, and she was from Texas, right? So Texas is sort of the epicenter of a lot of this stuff, and she's from the greater Dallas area. Her and she's trans. She's a little, little trans girl, and her mom supports her transition. And her father uh, does not support it. And they're divorced. And it's part of this bitter custody dispute that I think is still ongoing, although I, ha I haven't checked in on it in a while. Um, but the, the father basically went all over, you know, international right wing media appealing for help and fundraising and whatnot and got tons of attention, ended up, I think, on Tucker Carlson and all of that. Um, and it sort of launched this case into national consciousness, right? And, and that's when you first started to see Republican legislators saying, we, in Texas, this does not happen. We are gonna stand with this father, you know, I forget his name, um, but I, I don't have a very high opinion of him after doing a lot of research on it. Uh, and so I ended up writing about this case and it was a three or 4,000 word piece um, for Vox.com, where I sort of looked into the micro side of what actually was happening with this particular case, and then sort of brought it into the wider picture of this is what, you know, trans youth healthcare actually looks like, and what they say, and here are the misconceptions. So um, let me see if I can quickly find that link <laughs> before the end of our session. Um, but that's a really good place to start because I do think that the healthcare bills are the bigger of the the two threats and the two prong strategy from the conservative side. Yeah, thank you. Would love would love that link if you could share it and, um, and even uh, email it to Rachel if you're not able to share with us. Um, yeah. So that we could post it. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so Rodrigo, I thought I'd come to you. I don't see any other questions from the audience at the moment. Um, Oh, all right, well, they got me. Scoop me on my question. 
So the, from the audience, uh, are there particular corporations that are either um, great or notoriously bad on trans issues? Uh, any corporations we should be boycotting? That's a great question. Well, first of all, uh, you should be contacting any corporation that you're a frequent customer of and tell them that you want them to do the right thing on trans rights, that you want them to speak out. Uh, any company is amenable to public pressure. Well, virtually any, maybe not Chick-fil-A, but, but most companies are amenable to public pressure. And uh, most of them are really motivated to motivated by public opinion for better or for worse. So if you are a customer, if you have an account somewhere, uh, if you're a monthly subscriber to something, contact that company and tell them that you want them to do the right thing. Um, you can also find out where they're headquartered or where their biggest office is or something like that and tell them, speak out against an anti-trans bill in your state. So, you know, if, if they are headquartered in, uh, what's a, in Texas is a perfect example because Texas is fighting these bills right now. If they have a lot of staff in Texas, then they should be speaking out against that anti-trans bills in Texas. In terms of particular companies, uh, Starbucks is really solid. They're kind of known among trans people for offering really outstanding health benefits. So if you can scourge top of the barista at Starbucks and you're trans, um, really great health plan. Um, and that's been kind of this like word of mouth thing among trans people for, uh, for a while. So props to them for offering that kind of health coverage um, starting years and years ago before this was in the public consciousness as much. But again, every single company needs to hear from their customers that their customers want them to speak out. It made a really big difference in North Carolina when we were fighting HB2. Again, that was the infamous bathroom ban. Uh, companies spoke out against it, and that is part of how we were able to get a partial repeal of that really terrible ban. Um, so it shows that corporate pressure works. Again, for better or worse, there's pros and cons to it. Um, I don't love the idea of public policy being dictated by big corporations, but hey, as an activist, you use every tool you can, right, to get the job done. So any company that you have an account with, tell, uh, look up where they're headquartered and tell them if there's an anti-trans bill in that state, I, as a customer, expect you to speak out against it. Thanks. You just made me think. Corporations running public policy in America? No. Stop. Shocker. <laughs> shocker. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Well, we're near the end of our time. I, I'll just take this quick moment to thank Caitlin, Rodrigo, and Chase for spending this early evening with us or afternoon, depending on where you're located. My staff always reminds me that there are people on the West Coast, so I've got to shout them out. Uh, and maybe just give you each 30 seconds to leave us with a word of hope about um, what we're confronting. Rodrigo seems to have the most optimism, so maybe we'll save him for last so that I can be assured that these will be hopeful comments. Uh, and why don't we start with Caitlin? Um, 30 seconds, gosh. Uh, I would say just- um, <laughs> Not your superpower brevity. Not your <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have a podcast. So I should be able to blab. Um, I would say just don't be afraid of the conversation. You know, um, even if you're not trans, even if you don't know any trans people, if you just think that, you know, we're on the side of right on this, just don't be afraid to talk with your friends because sometimes that's the hardest thing like it's I think it's almost easier to call your legislator than it is to confront a friend who might be saying something transphobic so um yeah don't be afraid to have the conversation Chase you want to jump in yeah I mean I think as bleak as it feels on so many levels the reality is is that you know they can't reverse uh you know our existence, they can't reverse the love that we have in our lives, they can't reverse the support that we have. And so at the end of the day, like we are in a better position than we, we were five years ago, we will be in a better position in five years um, than we are now, um, in part because we're just going to keep fighting and all trans people have had the thought of, well, maybe I don't have to be trans. And we've all come to the conclusion that we simply are. Um, and that nobody can take that away from us. And it comes with a beautiful amount of self-awareness um, that is unique to the experiences that we have. And so it's a blessing and, and we're not going anywhere and, and that's positive and hopeful. 
Yeah, and what gives me hope is history, that we've done this before against even greater odds. I'm 35 years old. I came out in 2007, and that, in a way, was not that long ago, and yet it was a fundamentally different world. I mean, coming out in 2007 to coming out in 2021 is totally different. If we can make that amount of progress in just that amount of time, we're going to absolutely win this thing. I mean, the, it is just a matter of continuing to stay in it. Um, there, there's this, um, I, I think as an activist, you have to be an optimist because being an activist inherently means believing in the possibility of change. You know, you have to be this kind of like future seer. You have to be able to envision a different reality and be stubborn enough, optimistic enough, whatever you want to call it, to just pursue it and pursue it and pursue it until it's real. But the good news is that trans people have been doing that for generations. That's how we got to that point, to this point we're at today. So that's what gives me hope. Thanks for wrapping this up, Rodrigo. I really appreciate that. And because you are a new ED, I'm going to throw you this service. Everyone should donate to the National Center for Transgender Equality. Thank uh, you. Dan, who's joining us tonight. And of course, to the ACLU and Caitlin, if you've got a Venmo account that you want to drop in the link, we'll support your journalism as best we can. Uh, just let us know. But once again, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Chase, for spending this time with us. It's been really meaningful to me. Uh, this is the first time I'm really getting to meet each of you and already feel so much in community and so much love and hope that we can work together and that AFJ can be supportive of your issues and that you can be supportive of ours um, as a community of progressive organizations and um, activists. I think that we'll ultimately succeed in our goals if we link up, join arms, and try and march together. So with that, good night to everyone or good late afternoon to my people on the West Coast. I have forgotten you. And thank you again for joining us for another session of Holding Court. Thank you, Rakeem. Yeah, thanks for holding this, Rakeem. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, everyone.